thank you all for joining the Human Rights Lawyers Association this evening. My name is Rahab Jaffa and I sit on the HRLA's Executive Committee. Tonight's event, which is kindly being hosted by Wampum Court Chambers, is on the often overlooked issue of the conflict in Yemen and the role played by the UK government in particular on exacerbating the world's worst humanitarian crisis via its granting of arms export licenses to Saudi Arabia. We have a remarkable panel of domestic and international speakers with us here this evening, who will provide much more detail on the conflict in Yemen, an analysis of the UK's response to the Saudi coalition's alleged breaches of international humanitarian law against civilians in Yemen, as well as a breakdown of the legal issues that our discussion later will center around. We will hear from our panelists in the first hour and a half before they turn to answering your questions in the final 30 minute discussion period. Please do feel free to message your questions in the chat as the event proceeds. This event is being recorded and will be uploaded to the HRLA website should viewers wish to access this at another time. And we are very fortunate to have as our chair this evening, Mr. Wayne Jordash QC. He is a barrister at Doughty Street Chambers and a founding partner of Global Rights Compliance, LLP. Wayne is a leading expert in international humanitarian and human rights law, and he is globally recognized for his work across the spectrum of international tribunals. He is also ranked and recognized as one of the world's leading international criminal lawyers in both the Chambers and Partners UK Bar Guide 2017 and 2021 as well as in the 2017 Legal 500. As the managing partner of GRC, Wayne leads a group of lawyers in providing advisory services to international organizations, government officials, and business enterprises on issues relating to international humanitarian, criminal, and human rights law. Of particular relevance to this evening's event, however, Wayne is currently engaged in GRC's Yemen Accountability Project, in which he leads a team of legal experts who focus on strengthening the prospects of accountability for crimes being committed in Yemen, with a particular focus on the prospects of prosecuting the crime of starvation, the withholding of food, and the deliberate destruction of agricultural areas in Yemen. I don't think there is enough time in the day to cover all of Wayne's achievements and the important work that he does for transitional justice, particularly in respect of human rights investigations and fact finding missions across the globe. So I hope he will forgive me if I pause there and hand over this evening's metaphorical baton or microphone, as it were, to him so that he can introduce this evening's panel. Thanks, Wayne. Thank you very much, Rehab, and also thank you to the Human Rights Lawyers Association for arranging this event and inviting myself and also these speakers. Um, it's a, a fantastic array of speakers, and I'm confident we're going to learn a lot tonight um, about the UK's role in Yemen uh, and the violations which uh, are occurring in Yemen. So, as you know, we're going to focus on the UK arms sales to Saudi Arabia that supply the Saudi coalition's war efforts in Yemen. As Rehab has touched upon, the Yemeni conflict is now into its sixth year. According to the Yemen Data Project, an independent data coalition, collection project, more than 18,400 civilians have been killed or injured by Saudi Arabia and its Gulf allies since they launched a bombing campaign in 2015. To, to oust the Iran-backed Houthis and restore the government. According to the project, nearly a third of all Gulf coalition air raids on Yemen have hit civilian targets, including hospitals, schools, and food stores. Over 8,600 civilians, a quarter of them women and children, were killed during tens of thousands of air raids, marking 70% of the total civilian death toll documented by rights groups. Of course, these deaths, injuries, and potential war crimes by the Saudi coalition, as horrific as they are, are just a fraction of the overall attacks on civilians and civilian objects over the last six years. All sides are committing war crimes and crimes against humanity. 
the UN group of eminent experts on Yemen, amongst others, in its latest September 2020 report, has stated that there are reasonable grounds to believe that parties to the conflict, as well as conducting airstrikes in violation of the principles of distinction, proportionality and precaution, are engaged in a range of other war crimes that encompass murder, torture, cruel or inhuman treatment, rape, other forms of sexual violence, outrages upon personal dignity, denial of fair trials, and enlisting children under the age of 15 or using them to participate actively in the hostilities. And then, if we look further, and we, and we must look further, then these crimes that are the result of more direct action against civilians, one can see even more crimes. The war in Yemen has been fought using both economic and military strategies, both of which have contributed to the country's descent into famine. We are six years into this conflict and 10 million people face famine. Consequently, Yemen remains the world's worst humanitarian crisis. Nearly 80% of the population, over 24 million people, require some form of humanitarian assistance and protection. As reported by the World Food Programme and others in October of this year, acute malnutrition rates among children under the age of five are the highest ever recorded in parts of Yemen, with more than a million, half a million cases in southern districts. 98,000 children under five are at the high risk of dying without urgent treatment. At least a quarter of a million pregnant or breastfeeding women are also in need of treatment for mal malnutrition. My organization, Global Rights Compliance, as Rehab outlined, works extensively on the link between conflict and food insecurity and famine, including in Yemen, and the commission of starvation crimes. It is a terrible fact of modern wars, whether Syria, South Sudan, Northern Nigeria, or Yemen, that however grim the death count that results directly from airstrikes or boots on the ground, it often pales into insignificance when compared with deaths from the deprivation of objects indispensable for survival of civilians. As observed in 2018 by Tama Kirola, Save the Children's Country Director in Yemen, quote, for every child killed by bombs and bullets, dozens are starving to death and it's entirely preventable. Children who die in this way, quote, suffer immensely as their vital organs but their vital organ functions slow down and eventually stop, close quotes. One thing that is crystal clear, at least to my organization, and from, from studying the documentation, much of this suffering is avoidable or deliberate, and much of it involves the war crime of starvation. That is, the use of starvation as a method of warfare by depriving civilians of objects indispensable to their survival, including willfully impeding relief supplies. The range of intentional acts designed to deprive civilians of essentials with the intent to further war objectives and in the awareness of their impact are numerous and staggeringly common. An example, as reported by the Norwegian Refugee Council in September 2020, data collected by the Civilian Impact Monitoring Project in Yemen shows Yemeni farms have been hit at least 918 times by airstrikes and shelling in less than three years an average of almost one incident a day. From economic measures imposed by the Saudi-led coalition and the recognized government of Yemen on Houthi areas, to the blockading or restricting of ports, including the main port of Al-Hudaya, Al preventing the transport of food and fuel, to heavy airstrikes throughout Houthi-controlled territories, including upon agricultural land, to the destruction of vital infrastructure such as bridges, markets and warehouses and medical centers, to the impeding of vital humanitarian supplies and operations for civilians, and to the displacement of tens of thousands of people. Add together these many acts, and they look very much like the war crime of starvation and on a massive scale. No one has done more to document these violations than the independent Yemeni organization Matana for Human Rights that advocates for human rights through, through the documentation of violations, provision of legal support to victims, lobbying, awareness raising and capacity building. 
we are very lucky to have as our first speaker, Bonyan Gamal, accountability specialist at Muatana. Of the many NGOs that my organization works with globally, you will not find better than Muatana. Not only have they documented money, many of the violations, but in 2019 published a detailed report that links UK made bombs to specific attacks on civilian targets. Of 27 attacks on civilians they examined, 25 could be linked to munitions manufactured by US companies, while five could be linked to UK munitions. Onyan will discuss the pattern of violations generally and the actions that they are taking globally, including at the International Criminal Court and in national courts to try to achieve a measure of justice for these and other violations. Despite these grim statistics, Many states, and the UK is one, has con have, is one, have continued to provide arms and other military equipment to the various actors involved in the Yemeni conflict, first and foremost to the Saudi-led coalition's armed forces. The United States is the largest supplier, while the UK is by, by far the second largest. Our second speaker tonight, Andrew Smith, is the head of media at the NGO Campaign Against Arms Trade. Andrew has written extensively about the UK's arms dealings with the Middle East. As you will know, the campaign against arms trade challenged the legality of the UK's government's decision to continue to issue licenses for arms exports to Saudi Arabia, despite, as they argued, the clear risk that the weapons could be used for violations of international law in Yemen. The Court of Appeal found that the Secretary of State had failed to make an assessment as to whether there had been a pattern of previous violations of IHL in Yemen by Saudi Arabia, and that as a result, the government had failed to have regard to a centrally and obviously relevant factor in decisions to grant export licenses. On the 7th of July 2020, the government resumed granting licenses for export to Saudi Arabia, having purportedly applied a revised methodology to its decision making process. On the 27th of October 2020, the campaign filed a new challenge to these decisions. Along with describing the nature of these claims, Andrew will speak about the scale of the exports, including reflecting on the manner in which the export licenses are granted, their value, their transparency, and how much UK companies, including BAE systems, make from these exports. Our third speaker, Molly Mulready, was a former lawyer at the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Molly represented the UK in the initial proceedings brought by Andrew's organization in March 2016, before she resigned. In the United Kingdom, where resignation out of principle or ethics seems to be woefully out of fashion, Molly did resign, in part due to her views about the lawfulness of the government's actions, and in part because of her views of the awfulness of Prime Minister Johnson. Molly will discuss the UK's response to the litigation and why she arrived at the view that the licenses were unlawful. She will talk about how the government had approached, approached the clear risk threshold and what she thinks of Liz Truss's recent claim that the Saudi coalition's action in Yemen show no pattern of violations of international humanitarian law only isolated incidents, or rather violations that, quote, occurred at different times in different circumstances and for different reasons, close quote. Our fourth speaker is Nicholas Grubeck, barrister at Moncton Chambers. Nick represented the first interveners, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch and Rights Watch UK, in the 2019 Court of Appeal hearing of the Judicial Review. Nick benefits from extensive field experience, including in Afghanistan, Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan, Iraq, Mali, Ethiopia, and several more. Before coming to the bar, Nick worked for the United Nations in Afghanistan and Sudan. Nick will explain the role played by Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, and Rights Watch in the litigation. In particular, Nick will address the role that NGOs, the UN and other third parties played in challenging the UK government's assessment that there was little or no risk of the Saudi coalition committing violations of IHL. 
Against that background, he will look at the way potential future challenges in this area might play out and the potential role of civil society in that context. Finally, our fifth uh, speaker is Anna Stavriankis, an academic researching arms licensing at the University of Sussex, who has regularly given evidence to the UK's committees on arms export controls, which is responsible for parliamentary scrutiny of Britain's compliance with arms export control laws. Anna will be able to reflect on the role of the committees and of civil society in trying to generate accountability for UK arms export policy and on the obstacles they face in doing so. She will outline three key challenges in pursuit of accountability. Contestation over what can be reasonably known about the conduct of the war in Yemen. The networks that cut across the state, industry and civil society in pursuit of increased arms sales on the one hand and restraint on the other, and the role of legal challenge in generating change on the issue of arms export policy. So without further ado, I hand over to our first panelist, Bonyan of Motana, to open up the discussion. First, in relation to their work documenting the violations generally, and more specifically, looking at their 2019 report linking UK supply with specific violations. Each speaker will have 15 minutes, and I will remind each speaker when there are two minutes left, because it's important that we have time for at least 30 minutes of discussion at the end. Please text your questions, giving your name and organization and the panelists you wish to address. Bonyan, over to you. Thank you, Wayne. And uh, thank you um, at Human Rights Lawyers Association uh, for planning this very important event. Um, my name is Bunyan Jamal. I am a lawyer based in Sana'a. Um, I work with Muatana for Human Rights as part of the Accountability and Redress Unit. Uh, Muatana is a Yemeni organization. Um, we work in uh, the documentation of human rights abuses uh, by all parties uh, to the conflict. Um, we also provide legal support to victims of uh, arbitrary detention, enforced disappearances, uh, torture and uh, cases of women, children, and other minorities. Um, I will get uh, in more details of the work Matana does in a bit. Um, if I can add to what Wayne already said um, and give you a brief update of the humanitarian situation. Um, it is always very important to mention in the beginning that all parties to, to, the, to the conflict in Yemen are responsible for uh, uh, human rights violations, um, whether they are national parties or international or regional. Um, you can, of course, take a look at Muatana's annual report, um, latest annual report. It's, uh, it's public in Muatana's website. Uh, it will give you a more detailed view to the situation. Um, but to be uh, more specific to uh, um, violations committed by Saudi Arabia, UAE, and um, that part, um, we can say that uh, now it's been more than six years of, of the since the start of the military uh, campaign led by Saudi Arabia and UAE, um, during which um, the, the coalition um, continued to systematic, systematically undermine the lives of, of the Yemeni civilians. Um, from March 2015, which is the start of the um, uh, military campaign, until March 2020, Muatana documented at least 528 aerial attacks. Um, those attacks killed or wounded uh, civilians and damaged or destroyed civilian properties. Um, they killed uh, 3,717 civilians, including 946 women and 364 children. Um, that wounded also 2,878 um, civilians, 
including 738 women and 303 children. Um, these are the uh, airstrikes that Muatana were able to reach and properly document. Um, these were strikes that hit residential neighborhoods, villages, markets, bridges, uh, health facilities, schools, and other services and uh, business um, facilities. Um, um, these strikes destroyed what we can say was an already destroyed country. Um, and now with uh, COVID-19 hitting the entire world very hard, the war still continues to, to destroy and weaken the, um, the healthcare system. Um, more, more than half of Yemen's uh, health facilities are closed or partially functioning. And there are very critical shortages in uh, doctors and uh, medical facilities in more than 40% of uh, Yemen districts. Um, in Muatana's latest report on uh, health, uh, on attacks on uh, healthcare in, um, in Yemen, uh, Muatana documented 120 attacks on health facilities and medical personnel um, in, in all over Yemen in a period of 45 months. Um, and of course, the impact of each strike far, goes far beyond the, the civilians killed or injured. It's, uh, um, as Wayne uh, mentioned, um, previously, this entire war um, resulted in starvation, famine, and uh, very dangerous economical uh, um, um, uh, results. Um, that unfortunately leads us to a very important fuel of this war, uh, which are the weapons. Um, European countries, USA and UK, um, contribute to, to this war um, and unfortunately profit highly from it uh, by manufacturing or supplying weapons to countries committing these violations in Yemen. And that is one of the reasons Muatana is still working and expanding over um, um, to cover, to try and cover more areas uh, on the on the ground, um, we can say that Muatana's work is divided into two uh, main branches. Um, one is the work on the ground internally, and that is in two divisions. Uh, the first division is the research uh, and studies unit. Uh, it is the biggest unit in Muatana. And um, it covers uh, 21 governorates, that is out of 22 governorates, so almost the entire country, uh, with field researchers um, in the ground in each governorate. Some of the governorates, there are more than one researcher, depending on the number of violations, uh, how much it's happening, and um, how big is the governorate. Um, uh, these field researchers then file their findings to, to uh, uh, research assistants, um, more than nine research assistants on, in Sana'a, in, in this office. And uh, these uh, research assistants and data analysis uh, receive the information um, to be then processed and then um, published in what we can say is the other branch of Muatana's work, which is the outside work um, in advocacy or uh, what is used in accountability efforts, which is um, 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 where, where I, I work. Another branch of the internal uh, um, work that we are doing is the legal support unit. And this is a very important branch of, of lawyers. Um, 
uh, they work with more than 25 lawyers in the ground and in the office. Uh, we try to provide legal support for victims of enforced disappearances, um, arbitrary detentions, and cases of minorities, Yemen, uh, women, and uh, um, uh, religious groups. Um, and um, with with this, this is a, a sort of different kind of, of work where um, the lawyers uh, go directly to the authorities and try to, um, with the le with the very uh, low legal standards that are still present here, uh, try to to fight for uh, for these uh, victims. Uh, whether it's in the southern areas or northern areas, or whether it's uh, areas under uh, uh, Yemeni government or the Houthis, and so on. Um, outside the country um, is one of the um, new units that Muatana established is the Accountability and Redress Unit. Um, we try to explore the available accountability avenues that are in uh, um, international humanitarian law and uh, international criminal law, and try to go through with it to, to find some sort of accountability against uh, for the, for the um, um, violations that are uh, happening in uh, in Yemen, um, one of the most important projects was the ICC communication um, in um, uh, December, and also the criminal complaint in, in Italy in 2018. We will have a court hearing in January 2021. So I'm hoping, we are hoping this, this goes well. Um, the main idea of the accountability unit is that uh, we reached a conclusion where we uh, we found out that, um, and that was very clearly and very elegantly um, put in the GEE report, in the last GEE report, was that um, impunity for crimes in, uh, in Yemen was, uh, um, shocking um, and it's it's been a cycle for Yemen whether it's national parties national people who are responsible or international people um, it's been a cycle of impunity and um, violations uh, where nobody is held accountable and then a political agreement happen and and then um, another um, uh, regimes come and do the same and worse violations because they know that there is no accountability. And that also goes for the um, international and regional parties um, who are responsible for the violations in, in Yemen. Um, Unfortunately, and I will end with this um, with this idea. Um, uh, pe the people in Yemen usually look at uh, European countries and countries like the UK and the USA as countries where um, international um, human rights standards are very high, um, and that was a big shock for Yemenis to 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 find uh, in their homes, in their schools, in their hospitals, the remnants of bombs that are made on in, in, in these countries. Um, so the role that uh, these countries are, are doing is very disappointing, to, to be honest. And uh, it is expected by, by Yemenis and um, that the countries like uh, the UK should be playing a positive role in, in the peace process in, in Yemen. And it honestly could. Um, but unfortunately, um, countries like the UK are one way or another participating in, in the war. And um, 
directly and indirectly supporting um, uh, violators that are committing very horrific um, human rights uh, violations in, in Yemen. So thank you again for um, planning this event and I hope it goes well. Thank you very much, Bonyan. Um, a very interesting uh, account um, from somebody who um, clearly has um, many monitors on the ground. Uh, I think very interesting to hear you talk about um, the methodology in which you, you employ to actually document these crimes. And as anyone who's attempted to document uh, war crimes or violations of uh, international law will know, documenting these crimes is not easy. It requires um, commitment, it requires people on the ground, and as Bonyan has made clear, it requires you to look beyond the obvious. Uh, it requires you not just to look at the bombing, but the consequences of the bombing and the way in which the crimes and the violations um, it work together to come to a proper view as to whether violations of international humanitarian law are occurring or not. Uh, thank you, Bonyan, for, those, um, for, the, for that presentation. Our second speaker is Andrew Smith, uh, the head of media at the Campaign Against the Arms Trade, who will talk to us about the legal uh, challenge that they brought against the UK. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much. There's a few people who I'd like to thank before I start my contribution. First of all, I want to thank everyone at HRLA for putting on this event with many thanks in particular to Wayne and Rahab for their work in putting it together. I want to thank our legal team at Lee Day, Erin Alcock, Rosa Curling and Connor McCarthy, as well as the QCs that we worked with, Martin Chamberlain, Ben Jaffrey, and the special advocates, Angus McCulloch and Rachel Tony. I know that some of them are on the call tonight and they have formed a formidable team. They have provided expertise, support and dedication every step of the way. And I also want to thank the other NGOs that have intervened to boost our case, with Amnesty International, Oxfam Human Rights Watch, Rights Watch UK and their teams. CATS, doesn't, Campaign Against Arms Trade, does not have the money or resources of the Foreign Office or the Department of International Trade. In comparison, we operate on a shoestring. We were only able to fund our case through a crowdfunder. It would not have been possible without this, and we're very grateful to everyone who has been there for us throughout this campaign and everyone who has supported us. It may be Kat who has led it, but we've certainly not been acting alone and it has only been because of the support of very good people and such a strong movement, which has allowed us to build the campaign in the first place. I want us to go back to 2015. It was a very different time in Britain. David Cameron was still in charge of the country. Brexit had not happened. COVID-19 would not have meant a thing. It was a very long time for all of us. We've had three elections since then. I want you to think of where you were in 2015 and how much has changed for you and how much has changed for our country in that time. Because it is a very long time. And it was also the year in which Saudi-led forces began the brutal and devastating bombardment. And it is a bombing campaign that continues. Um, almost immediately, there were very serious and very credible claims of Saudi forces breaching international humanitarian law, with one of the first high profile atrocities of the war being the bombardment of a refugee camp which killed up to 40 people. This was not an aberration, this was the first of many atrocities, with schools, hospitals and homes being hit in the months ahead. Since then there have been strikes on weddings, funerals, family gatherings and even a school bus. Sites of celebration and joy and moments of mourning have been turned into massacres. And there's no doubt that UK made weapons have played a key role in this bombing campaign and in these atrocities. UK trained Saudi personnel have flown UK built aircrafts and used them to drop UK made bombs and fire UK made missiles. It is impossible to know the total value of these arms sales because those totals are not published. Of one investigation by Campaign Against Arms Trade and The Guardian found that BAE Systems alone has made £15 billion in revenues from arms sales and services provided to Saudi forces since the war began. BAE hasn't even made any of the bombs or missiles. The real total could be far higher. 
But this hasn't happened overnight. It's a relationship that has been decades in the making with successive governments providing the same uncritical political and military relationships to the Saudi dictatorship, whether it has been Labour governments, Conservative governments, or coalition governments, they have all followed very much the same policy. 2015 was when our first legal letters were submitted, um, outlining our plans to take legal action. One thing we've learned from the process is that the law can take time. Our case was a clear one. On paper, arms export controls are very clear. They say that if there is a clear risk that a weapon might be used in a serious violation of international humanitarian law, then a weapon should not be sold. Since this terrible bombardment began, Saudi forces have been accused of some of the most serious possible breaches of international humanitarian law. These accusations have not just come from campaign against arms trade, they have come from a United Nations expert panel which has accused Saudi forces of serious and systematic violations of international humanitarian law. They have come from MSF who have, um, who, who have shown the, a, terribly, a, a terrible bombardment which has been inflicted on their hospitals. These allegations have come from Amnesty, from Oxfam, from two House of Commons committees, from a House of Lords committee, from ev almost every single reputable NGO with people on the ground in Yemen. They have been documented at length by groups like Martina who have put so much into doing this. The only people who seem to be arguing otherwise are the Saudi royal family and the UK government. Our team argued that in approving sales, the government had to take a, a, had to take a view on these allegations and whether they amounted to a pattern of abuse, whether they amounted to a clear risk. Now, this may seem like a very basic point, but it is one which they had failed to do. And we believe then, as we do now, that any reasonable interpretation of the guidelines should surely see an end of sales to the Saudi coalition. In 2016, we were given permission to bring the case to the High Court. In 2017, we lost in the High Court. It was a very disappointing decision and one which we appealed in 2018. In 2019, our case was heard in the Court of Appeal where we won, with the court finding that the government had acted unlawfully and irrationally. This was an unprecedented legal win. It meant that the government had to put, had to put on hold all new armed licenses while it undertook a new and legally compliant review of the sales that had taken place. In July 2020, three month, four months ago, the government announced that it completed its review and that it was resuming the sales. Predictably, the decision was a whitewash. Very little evidence was presented with the Trade Minister, Liz Truss, concluding that there was no pattern of violations. She said that although the Ministry of Defence was tracking over 500 potential international humanitarian law violations at the time, Roughly two weeks since the beginning began, since the bombing began, she concluded that these were merely isolated incidents. But these so-called incidents are not numbers in a spreadsheet. They are schools, they are hospitals, they are homes, and they are lives. Thousands of people have been killed in this brutal bombardment, and many more by the humanitarian crisis that it has enabled. Their lives are far too important to be dismissed as isolated incidents, and far too important to be ignored in this way. And that is why last month, we announced that we've begun a new legal process to challenge this abhorrent and shameful decision. We do not believe that the decision was an ethical one, and we do not believe that it was a legal one. We do not believe it was made on a sound legal basis. So what did our first case achieve, other than setting precedent? Well, there is no doubt that it caused a major headache for the arms dealers. According to the then Trade Minister, Lee Fox, there were 57 arms licenses under consideration at the time of the verdict. This morning, it was revealed to the Committee on Arms Export Controls that over 500 applications have been processed in the four months alone since the decision to resume sales in July. This shows how much money is on the table for these companies and how much profiteering they are doing. Our verdict will also have been key in halting the new fighter jet sale that BAE has been negotiating with the UK government and the Saudi military. Um, it has been publicly negotiating this sale since 2015. In 2018, Mohammed bin Salman, the Saudi Crown Prince, visited London, uh, where he was given a red carpet treatment. He enjoyed lunch with the Queen, he enjoyed dinner with Prince Charles, and he had his photo taken on the steps of Downing Street. And he left having secured um, a further development in negotiations and entering the final stage of negotiations. The fact that these sales have not materialised is important. I believe that our case has been a very important part of that not happening. It has also been a cause, huge cause of embarrassment for the UK government and for the Saudi regime, 
having exposed the shameful way they do business and the immoral relationship that exists between them. But none of this is enough. Our win in 2019 was vitally important, but it did not stop the war. It should not have taken a four year long legal campaign brought by activists to force the government to apply its own rules. And it should not have taken a crisis on that scale, the worst humanitarian crisis in the world and the lives of so many Yemeni people to force the government to apply its own rules. Because ultimately the government is not an observer in this war. It is an active participant. It has played a key role in enabling and exacerbating the crisis. And that's why we must do everything that we can to end its complicity. That's why we are doing this case. I want to thank you for having me and I want to uh, thank everyone who's been part of our case so far. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, a very um, forceful um, and direct um, presentation. Um, I think highlighting, I think, um, well, the 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 propound the, the weight of uh, opinion which seems to be against the UK's view. Um, I think quite interesting to hear you talk about the diversity of views um, and on the one side and on the other side. Uh, perhaps this is where the embarrassment comes from, um, the UK and the uh, Saudi, Saudi Arabia on the other, um, perhaps not um, exactly what um, global um, reputation the UK um, would like. Um, thank you, Andrew. Now, um, let's turn to the other side um, and get some uh, insights as to what um, formed the UK's view Molly Mulready, as I've said already, was a former lawyer at the UK uh, FCO and was part of, of um, the, um, the litigation that Andrew's just told us about before resigning um, on a point of principle. Uh, Molly? Thank you. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to, to join you this evening. It is a genuine privilege to share a platform with a group of experts who've been working on this situation on the on the right side for such a long time when I have been working on the on the wrong side as I now see it. Um, as Wayne mentioned in the introduction, I was a lawyer at the Foreign Office and part of my responsibilities there were to advise successive foreign secretaries on the legal issues arising from the export of arms to the Middle East. So when I first arrived to the Foreign Office, the controversy was about the export of arms to Israel. And that was in the context of Operation Cast Lead and Operation Protective Edge and the controversy around the civilian deaths in Gaza that were a result of those. So that was the first controversy that I dealt with. That As that subsided, the Saudi conflict in Yemen started to um, come to the fore. And then that was what occupied a lot of my time at the Foreign Office was then advising about the law um, as it related to the export of arms to Saudi Arabia. Now, I have recently made public my view that the government exporting arms to Saudi Arabia at the moment is unlawful. And I hope to convince everybody listening, if you're not already convinced um, that it is unlawful. To do that, I want to just uh, tell you about the behind the scenes process that happens in the Foreign Office when um, licensing decisions are being made um, so that you can understand the context in which this sits. And I'll then talk in simple terms about the law uh, which Andrew has already um, set out. Uh, I'll then look at the evidence that's available that I think supports my view that the UK government is breaking the law by exporting arms to Saudi Arabia. And then I'll address, as Wayne said in the introduction, um, Liz Truss's recent comments to Parliament. So everyone in Britain and British needs a license in order to export arms. And how they get those licenses is by applying to the Department for International Trade. That department doesn't decide the license application on their own. They ask the Foreign Office for a recommendation about whether they should grant or refuse it. And that, you know, that makes sense because the Foreign Office has access to lots of international information. We've got diplomats in the region. We've got specialist country desks in London. We've got Yemen desk. We've got Saudi desk. We've got good relationships with international organisations and we get information from the Ministry of Defence as well. That's all put together, all of that relevant information, it's all sent up to the Foreign Secretary and he's asked to make a recommendation on the basis of that information to the Department for International Trade about whether to grant or refuse a licence and then the final decision is taken by the Department for International Trade. 
Now, both the Foreign Secretary's recommendation and the Department for International Trade's final decision have to be made in line with the relevant law. The government has to comply with the law. This is not optional. Whatever it may think, however it may behave, the government has got to adhere to the rule of law. Fortunately, the law in this area is, is quite simple and it's most pretty much all, all, all of it that's relevant for our discussion this evening is contained in one sentence and that sentence is as follows. The government must not grant a license where there is a clear risk the items to be licensed might, might be used in a serious violation of international humanitarian law. And that's the body of law that governs the conduct of parties to an armed conflict, it's called IHL for short. Now, I think that one sentence bears breaking down into four distinct parts, which are all important. So first of all, there's the clear risk. So you're looking for something more than a possibility, something more than possible, but below likely. That's the kind of risk threshold that you're in. And then the risk assessment that's being done is item specific. So you're not just looking at what are the Saudis going to do in general. You're looking at what are the Saudis going to do with this specific item for this specific license. So usually in this context, what we're looking at is precision guided missiles or equipment for Typhoon aircraft and sometimes um, components for military helicopters. That's the kit that's in scope, really, of what we're talking about this evening. So that's the second component is about the items to be licensed. The third, and I think the most important part of this one line that kind of determines everything, is the word might. So the person doing the risk assessment has to say, has to decide whether there's a clear risk the items to be licensed might, only might, be used in a serious violation of IHL. Just has to be a possibility. They don't have to decide that it will, that those items will be used in a serious violation of IHL, just that they might. That, in my view, is a low threshold. And then the fourth part of this one line is that we're looking at serious violations of IHL. And they should be distinguished from violations of IHL. They're not the same thing. So a violation of IHL can be, for example, something like um, failing to safeguard the fair trial rights of somebody who's sentenced and convicted in, in a conflict situation. So if there are not the kind of judicial checks and balances that we'd expect to see in something that we would recognize as a fair trial, that can be a violation of IHL. A serious, and, and I think that that's right, you know, the right to a fair trial is, is, an, is important and should have the protection of international law in my view. A serious violation of IHL is a completely different order of things. Serious violations of IHL are war crimes. They're grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions and they're breaches of particular parts of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. And I just want to zone in on, on one such serious violation not because I think there are only, there's only that one type in scope of this discussion, but I think it's the most relevant one. And um, for law geeks, it's Article 8.2b4 of the Rome Statutes. Um, I'm not going to read it out because it's, it's long, as my children would say, um, but essentially it prohibits recklessness as to disproportionate loss of civilian life when set against the anticipated military advantage that will be gained by the action that the um, person is taking, that the military force is taking. So to illustrate that with an example, um, if you have a munitions factory of the opposing military force, for example, that would be, it would be uncontroversial to consider that a legitimate military target. But if that munitions factory is a rubbish munitions factory that makes, for example, one gun a year, and it's in a school playground and there are 200 children all playing around that rubbish one gun a year munitions factory. If you drop a bomb on that munitions factory, in my view, that is a serious violation of IHL because the anticipated military gain from taking out such a low value military target when set against such high loss of civilian life is disproportionate. So that's a serious violation. That's as much as I want to say about the law as I see it, um, as it relates to arms exports, I think far more interesting is the evidence. And it really is overpowering. 
when I was preparing for this talk today, I was really struck by just the absolute abundance of evidence. I mean, you could, you could, I, I could have spoken to you for like 10 hours just listing out all the evidence, but you will be relieved to know that I am not going to do that. I'm instead going to try and give you a kind of chronological overview of the Saudi conduct in the Yemen conflict over the last five years um, to show how that conduct has developed and um, with particular reference to how, how it was seen by the UK government with reference to documents that are in the public domain. So in January 2016, there were 114 alleged incidents of potential concern in the conflict in Yemen, which the Ministry of Defence in London were tracking. At the time, the Ministry of Defence thought that a third of those uh, 114 incidents had been carried out by the Saudi-led coalition. And they were not able to identify a legitimate military target in any of those strikes. In any of that third, they didn't have a, they didn't, they couldn't identify a legitimate military target. When you set that against the importance of the proportionality assessment that I've just mentioned and how you determine what's a serious violation of IHL, I think that's quite an important point. And in among that, those incidents being tracked by the Ministry of Defence, there were three allegations of strikes on medical facilities. Now, at that time, um, the Foreign Secretary was advised by his officials, including me, um, that there were significant concerns around IHL compliance by the Saudi-led co coalition, and that the judgment as to whether the refusal threshold was met, so whether there was that all-important clear risk, was finely balanced. So January 2016, it was finely balanced. October 2016, there was an airstrike on a funeral hall in Sana'a, which killed 140 people. Advice that went to the Foreign Secretary days after that said that whether the refusal threshold was met was now extremely finely balanced. But it was still okay, there was still no clear risk and the flow of arms could continue. In December 2017, there were 318 possible violations being tracked by the Ministry of Defence. I don't know whether it was considered finely balanced or extremely finely balanced at that point, but it was still considered lawful. There was still considered no clear risk and so the flow of arms continued. By July 2020, there were 516 incidents being tracked by the Ministry of Defence. That's an average of 1.5 per week for five years. And having been forced by the Court of Appeal through the determined and commendable uh, legal action of campaign against the arms trade, having been forced by that uh, to, agree, to address the question of whether there was an historic pattern of violations of IHL, uh, the government did so. And Liz Truss told Parliament that some of those alleged incidents were being treated as violations of IHL by the UK government, but because they were at different times, in different circumstances and for different reasons, the conclusion was that they were isolated incidents, that there was no clear risk and that the arms sales could continue. Now, my view on that is that it is nonsense. In, in the true sense of the word, there is no sense to it. Um, I hope to convince you of that with some examples. I'm particularly interested in this trust uh, justifying the conclusion that there are, these are isolated incidents by reference to the different times, different circumstances, different reasons, um, you know, trilogy. If you take two airstrikes, so airstrike A, and these are hypothetical examples I have to stress. Airstrike A takes place at a time at nine o'clock on a Monday morning in circumstances in which there's a school full of children. And the reason for it is that there's thought to be a munitions factory nearby. And then you've got airstrike B that takes place at three o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. It takes place in a market full of shoppers. And the reason for it is that there's thought to be an opposition military figure nearby. You've got two airstrikes, different times, different reasons, different circumstances. But if they have the same perpetrator, can they seriously be said to be entirely isolated from one another? Of course not. If you think of a man who carries out a series of murders, all at different times, in different circumstances, for different reasons, 
the only thing that they all have in common is that that same man is doing them. And he does it repeatedly over five years. No one would seriously suggest there's not a pattern to his behavior, that each murder was an isolated incident. That would be quite ridiculous. Not only that, but there would be urgent, strenuous, right efforts to apprehend that man, not just to bring him to justice for what he's already done, but because the future risk of a repeat is so high that people would want to apprehend him to prevent it happening again. And so it is with the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen. Liz Truss says isolated incidents. We have the same perpetrator, the Saudi-led coalition, in the same conflict in Yemen, with often the same conduct, airstrikes, with often the same weapons, often British supplied, with the same harm, civilian deaths and civilian injuries, and the same IHL concerns, now being raised from all directions of international experts from Amnesty International to the UN. And all of this for five years. Despite that, Liz Truss, Dominic Raab, Boris Johnson, they say there's no clear risk that British items even might be used in even one serious violation of IHL in the future. I don't agree. And I hope I've convinced you not to agree either. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much. Um, I think that was a, a masterclass in uh, how to present uh, the most um, uh, clear um, enunciation of the law and uh, apply the facts to it. Um, Thank you. One thing I think um, I'd like to pick up on uh, during the discussion is um, we're talking about violations of international humanitarian law, but we haven't as yet touched upon crimes against humanity, which um, for, for many of those listening uh, will know that um, depend upon uh, the um, an attack which is on a civilian population, which is widespread or systematic. Uh, when I was listening to what you were talking about, those were the thoughts which were going through my head. The, this, uh, the, these sound um, like war crimes, but they also sound like they're widespread and systematic, which uh, you know is the context in which crimes against humanities uh, are found uh, established. Um, I hope we can return to, to that um, in the uh, discussion. Thank you very much, Molly. Um, now turning, if I can, to um, Nick Grubeck, uh, the uh, barrister at Moncton Chambers who represented Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch and Rights Watch uh, UK. Um, he will uh, be able to uh, talk to us about the role of those NGOs and also the potential for future challenges in this area. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, and thank you all for being here, if only virtually. And thank you also very much for the invitation for arranging this event. Now, I was one of a team of lawyers acting for the three interveners in this case. And what I want to do is briefly look at the focus of that intervention, and specifically at the role of third parties and third party evidence in these proceedings. We've heard from the claimant's perspective, we've, Molly has given us an idea of when went on on the defendant's side, what was the role of the third parties in this? And with that background, I then also want to briefly look at what kind of lessons might there be for future cases of this type. Now, we intervened right from the outset of these proceedings. And the challenge for any intervener in a case such as this one, where you've got an expert claimant and an incredibly able legal team, is how can you possibly add value in the proceedings? Indeed, why intervene at all? And there's two important points here. The first is that
We seem to have lost Nick. I'm sure he'll be reconnecting soon. I wonder if we may perhaps consider moving on to the next panellist until Nick is able to rejoin and we can return to him later. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, let's, let's move. I'm, I'm sure Nick will um, uh, rejoin. Um, let's move to Anna. Stavriankis, who, um, as I said earlier, um, has given evidence to the UK's committees on armed export controls and is going to talk about uh, some of the challenges in pursuit of uh, accountability in, in Yemen uh, and, and the networks that cut across um, the state industry and civil society in pursuit of these arms sales and um, the role of legal challenge, uh, such as those brought by CAT in generating change on the issue of arms export policy. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Wayne, and thank you, Rahab, as well, and everybody who's made this evening possible. I'm really happy to be um, on such a, a varied and, and interesting panel. I've learned a lot already, so thank you all. Um, I'd like to offer three reflections uh, to the webinar as a long-term observer of UK arms export policy and of civil society activism trying to restrain it. I see three key challenges in the pursuit of accountability for the harms caused by arms exports. Challenges around knowledge, around networks and around routes to change. The first challenge is that of knowledge or perhaps more accurately non-knowledge. There is a public contestation underway between the government, the UK government and its critics over what can reasonably be known about the harms being perpetuated with UK supplied weapons in Yemen. The previous speakers have made clear the extent of civilian harm of the war in Yemen. There is by now and has been for several years wide ranging evidence of civilian harm coming from varied national and international actors from the UN to civil society organizations. And the UK government has not challenged the veracity of any of that evidence. Instead, it simply says that it is not obliged to disprove open source information and that it has other secret evidence and information, information that nobody outside of government or outside of closed court sessions can see, which we are then supposed to accept casts doubt on or outweighs all that mass of open source evidence. The government has routinely failed to provide ministers to give evidence to the parliamentary committees responsible for scrutinizing arms export policy. It is simply refusing to allow parliament to do its job properly. This is part of a strategy of non-knowledge the deliberate mobilization of doubt and ambiguity about what can reasonably be known. The government is not actually engaging in a debate or a discussion or an argument or even acknowledgement about, of the facts of the war in Yemen. Until July this year, it was saying that it simply didn't know whether the Saudi-led coalition had committed violations of international law because it turns out it hadn't asked and hence, had decided that there was no clear risk that weapons might be misused. After that policy was found to be unlawful, it then moved to saying that whilst it does know that there have been potential violations, violations that the government has agreed to treat as established violations for the purposes of risk assessment, although there have been these potential slash established violations, they are isolated incidents and not enough to form a pattern and hence conveniently no clear risk 
and no reason to suspend arms exports. So on the one hand, the legal challenge and the public pressure from the controversy over arms exports to the Saudi-led coalition has forced a shift in the public legitimation undertaken by the government, which is a tiny incremental improvement and fairly significant. But on the other hand, the government is still continuing to license weapons, so the end result is the same. It's also worth noting that deliveries of weapons licensed under already uh, granted licenses were allowed to continue whilst licensing was prohibited. So I think we can see here quite clearly that the government has is facing multiple audiences. It has a domestic audience, which is a, a public audience, which is quite clearly opposed to the ongoing sale of weapons to the Saudi-led coalition. But it's much more in interested in talking not only to arms companies, which is often our first point, port of call, but also to the Saudi regime and to its, um, to its uh, friends overseas. So I think the next step in the public contestation over what can be known uh, about arms exports to Saudi Arabia is to engage in a contest over claims about what constitutes a pattern and how patterns are to be interpreted for the purposes of risk assessment. This is what I see as the first main challenge, a contest over who gets to make authorized and accepted claims and whose knowledge claims count. And I offer you a small thought experiment. Can you imagine the government acting in this way as it does uh, around arms exports to Saudi Arabia? Can you imagine the government acting this way with regard to counterterrorism? A policy that operates on the basis of, su of suspicion, hunches, no clear evidence, and so on. Comparing those two uh, types of issue, I think, is very instructive in how the government thinks about prevention, preemption, and risk. The second challenge facing efforts at accountability is navigating the uneven playing field of two different networks that are in play, one that's in favor of arms exports and one that's in favor of restrictions or abolition. In the narrowest sense, the legal challenge that's been underway and has, is trying to be resurrected is campaign against arms trade versus the government. But as Andrew has already indicated, certainly for Kat's part, neither of these actors are working alone. There were interveners in the legal case about whom I hope we'll hear shortly. And campaign against, all, campaign against arm trade is also outside of the legal case, part of a wider landscape of the peace and social justice movement and part of the group of NGOs working on arms transfer controls in the UK, which includes Amnesty, Oxfam, Safe World, amongst others, who themselves are also acting in solidarity with organizations such as Muatana. Some of these NGOs in turn work with parts of what was DFID before it was merged with the Foreign Office and some parts of the Foreign Office, those parts that are in favor of stick to controls, the human rights and good governance types, and with MPs on the parliamentary committees who are interested in tighter controls. This network in favor of tighter controls has to be understood in relation to the network of actors in favor of ongoing arms exports made up of, amongst others, the Ministry of Defense, other parts of the Foreign Office interested in maintaining good relationships with Saudi Arabia and other members of the coalition, number 10, and BAE Systems as the prime contractor and all of their supporters in Parliament. And this network is much more powerful in terms of money, access to political power, control over information than the network in favor of restrictions. One thing I think is really important to remember here is that BAE Systems ostensibly a private company, is acting directly on behalf of the UK state. The, uh, the arms agreements between the UK and Saudi Arabia take the form of government to government contracts, which the Ministry of Defense contracts BAE systems to deliver. It then uh, subcontracts parts of that out further to, to other suppliers in the supply chain. So when BAE systems says that licensing decisions are a matter for government and it abides by all laws and policies. And when the Ministry of Defense says that it doesn't have full visibility of what BAE Systems is doing in Saudi Arabia and that it won't disclose information that it is responsible for because it is commercially confidential, 
then we need to start asking questions about the relationships between the state and the arms industry. So the playing field for accountability is not at all even. People concerned about arms exports need to start thinking strategically about how to leverage their ideas and influence. And so my question to, to the audience tonight would be, where can lawyers best lend their weight? And this takes me to my last point, the role of the law in generating change. This legal challenge, the one that is now closed, and the one that hopefully will be reopened is both very complicated, but also at the end of the day, very simple. The UK has a legal obligation not to license weapons exports where there is a clear risk they might be used in serious violations of international humanitarian law. As Molly so beautifully outlined, hours of time and reams of virtual and physical paper have been spent defining clear, serious might and so on. But the war in Yemen has, for me, and I think for many, been the straw that broke the camel's back. And that's what makes it actually very simple. The evidence is so overwhelming of the use of foreign supplied weapons in violations of international law that we are not talking about fine grained, see it both ways types of arguments. We are talking about power. The government wants to maintain its arms relationship with Saudi Arabia in particular at all costs. Damn the consequences for the people of Yemen who are supposed to be protected by international law and also damn the consequences for British political life. The rule of law as evidenced by the demise of the serious fraud office inquiry into corruption in arms sales to Saudi Arabia. And damn the consequences for the self image of an international order based on values around peace, security and justice. Now, if you never believed that self image of Britain and its role in the international system, you'll be less shocked by that. But I find this case quite interesting in how clearly it lays bare British contempt for the ostensible rules of international order. And that's what makes the legal challenge so important and also so interesting. A legal challenge has the ability to interest a much wider range of people people who would prefer it if the UK government didn't break international law and are worried about the damage to the UK's reputation if it is seen to be doing so, regardless of whether these people are particularly or specifically interested in the arms trade or know much about the war in Yemen. This, that focus makes the, the, the court case a pivotal moment for debating those wider issues and hopefully through that generating some form of accountability for what's been happening in Yemen as a step towards a just peace in, the, in that country. But there are also limitations to the law. We've already seen how the law can swing both ways. The High Court found in favor of the government after all. And it was only after the Court of Appeal or at the Court of Appeal that the government's behavior was found to be unlawful. And we have to wait to see if permission will be granted for this next case. The law is not outside of power. Indeed, I would venture that the law is all too often an instrument of power. So where does this leave lawyers who are interested in progressive change? That's the question I'd like to leave with the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for a very clear enunciation of the challenges that um, uh, those uh, affected by those these um, uh, violations and, and the government's connection to it face in trying to bring these um, issues to the to the fore to a to a courtroom and to some kind of uh, workable uh, remedy one thing that i think would be also useful to think about in the um, discussion afterwards is the, the the particular role of the bae systems which um, anna touched upon uh, I certainly was shocked to to find um, when I was um, first getting involved in um, looking at uh, the Yemen uh, conflict, the role of BA systems, which um, you know at, at one point in time was em employed six thousand three hundred uh, uh, employees in in Saudi Arabia in a supporting capacity to the Saudi Air Force, and um, that th those roles, including included the loading of bombs onto planes, the setting of fuses for intended targets, the operation of liaison officers inside command and control centers, 
and so on and so forth. I think um, what we've touched upon so far is is, is mainly the export of uh, weapons. But um, as as I think all of us know, on this panel, um, the role of BAE systems is is a, a much more um, varied and uh, widespread uh, role. Nick is back, thankfully. Um, so over to you, Nick. Right, well, second time around, long may it last. Uh, I was going to talk about the role of the interveners in this case, and more generally about the role of third parties in this kind of litigation. And the question was, you've got a case brought by an expert claimant with an extremely high quality legal team behind them, what can you add as an intervener? And there are two important elements. The first is that having interveners and especially a group of interveners of extremely well-known and expert NGOs in this field shows that this isn't just one organization, this is a coalition um, behind this case. And this is a concern that goes wider than just an individual claimant. Um, the second is that it adds extra resources, both in terms of just looking at specific legal points, but perhaps more importantly, in terms of filling in the factual picture and providing evidence. And in doing so, we obviously coordinated very closely amongst the different teams, but we broadly addressed three different areas. The first of these was we provided support for the factual case regarding the concerns, what is happening in Yemen, what is the position on the ground, the benefit of drawing on a network on the ground, uh, both direct staff and local partners, and extensive investigatory work that we were able to rely upon in putting further evidence before the court. Um, secondly, we were able to deal with specific legal points that we had identified in coordination with the claimant, things such as the proper interpretation of the threshold of clear risk of a serious violation of international humanitarian law, or the role of the Articles on State Responsibility. More generally, have, and perhaps most importantly, was the third point, which was what is the value and unique advantage of NGO, UN, and other third party evidence, evidence of violations of IHL and human rights law? Um, how should that be reflected in the court's methodology, but also in the government's assessment? And that assumed an increasingly important role as we went from the High Court, where of course the case was not successful, to the Court of Appeal, because the High Court had taken a fairly dim view of the role of third party evidence. It had in, ev in essence agreed with the Secretary of State who argued that, well, the government is in a much better position. We have, we the government have unique information about what's happening in Yemen given access to the Saudis and their partners. So information that they provide that isn't in the open domain. And similarly, given technical capacities, things such as, of course, this wasn't spelled out, but things like drone footage that might be available to the government that can be relied upon and closed that again, NGOs wouldn't have access to. And I said, well, that means we've got a picture of the situation that third parties just can't match. Now, there's a counter argument to that, of course, and that is that while the government might have one side of the story, they very often will lack the other side of the story. The UK government will have to rely very heavily on what coalition countries tell it and what they are prepared to share. Information will be provided both in terms of what those countries like Saudi and the others involved in Yemen have themselves got access to, the way they are prepared to present it, and the limitations they might impose on access. Um, even 
if we're talking about the government's own intelligence and sources, that will very often be heavily context dependent and will not give you the full picture. Now, that's something I had a lot of personal experience with. I worked for years in Afghanistan as an investigator for the UN, for the Afghan National Human Rights Commission. And we would often go to sites of incidents, be those airstrikes or suicide bombings or shootings, a wide range of incidents, but we'd be able to go to areas others simply could not go to and speak to people who would only speak to us because of our status as a neutral third party. There's no way a lot of the people you spoke to would have spoken to the government, even if the government had been able to access that area. But that means that especially in analyzing whether there's been violations of IHL of human rights law, you as a third party bring a unique perspective to this. Um, that, of course, applies equally in Yemen. Now that, as I said, is not the view the divisional court took and that the Court of Appeal, we tried to make this point, perhaps less personally and more dispassionately than I've just made it, but um, we very much emphasize there is a long line of judicial authority that emphasizes the importance of evidence from NGOs, from the UN, from the European Parliament, from various third parties that were able to explain why what is happening in Yemen is such a problem. Secondly, um, we explained, as I just have, why third parties are likely to get access to the kind of information and to a perspective that is not going to be available to the UK government, even with all its contacts within the Saudi military with its technical resources and with its specific insight on the military side. And in that context, we argue, it was wrong to treat the information available to the Secretary of State as displacing or discounting the evidence available from third parties. Um, the Court of Appeal accepted that point and give a very helpful judgment um, about the importance of third party evidence, including that relied upon by CAT and that brought to bear by the interveners. Um, in acknowledging that, I think we made a hopefully useful contribution in the context of this particular case, but also more widely, this is going to be something of value in future cases of this kind. And that's something to look forwards to. After 9-11, there's been a lot of litigation about the direct role played by UK and other forces in conflicts abroad, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in other environments. There's been a real focus on what did British soldiers, other soldiers do in that environment. Over time, it's clear that focus has shifted and it's become increasingly less about what was it that British personnel did themselves and more, what kind of support, what kind of assistance is provided to what others do. Now, as we know from this case, that doesn't make what's happening on the ground any less concerning. It is simply that there are different kinds of connection to be drawn. So there's issues in terms of embedded trainers. It's conducting trainings for units operating abroad, foreign militaries, militias, whatever it is, providing equipment and supplies, sharing intelligence, providing monetary support, or as in this case, selling weapons and arms. That kind of assistance is now in many contexts, a critical part of what's going on but it's much, much harder to challenge than direct involvement. So how does third party evidence and more generally the role of NGOs feature in this context? Well, I would argue that CAT and the case you and the interveners were able to bring and succeed in in the Court of Appeal 
uh, has been a very significant step in ensuring that governments are held to account, not just what they do with their own hands, but also for what they facilitate. And ensuring that the path towards accountability for support and assistance continues will require the continued and active involvement by NGOs, be they local actors, such as Martana, or international NGOs, such as the Campaign Against Arms Trade, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, or what was then Rights Watch International. And the role in this context is twofold. The first is evidence becomes increasingly crucial because the links that will be underpinning concerns tend to be much more nebulous. They tend to be much more abstract and technical. One has to follow patterns of licensing, of monetary support, of grants, of training, approvals given in that context. It's not just a question of who did what, but a much bigger picture that needs to be documented. And the evidence built by third parties in that context is critical. Secondly, in many cases, it will be essential for third party actors and NGOs to step into the role of the claimant. And that, as Andrea has explained, is a very significant undertaking. You're looking at potentially years of litigation, of crowdfunding required to support this. But often, individuals in these kind of challenges will struggle to access the court to get the kind of support they need. And they may very well be in a much more difficult position in terms of dealing with country-wide assistance, systemic violations, the sort of evidence that needs to be addressed, the sort of arguments that need to be made to deal with that. So, as has been said, this case has created a major headache for those selling arms in Saudi. It's definitely not the last word, and Anna was clear that the odds may well be stacked against claimants in these kind of cases, but win or lose, in order to keep a spotlight on this kind of assistance that the UK government and others are providing in Yemen and elsewhere, it is imperative that these cases continue to be brought and the evidence supporting them continues to be collated and put into the mix. Great. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Nick. Um, very, very clear. Um, it struck me actually as you were talking about the importance of um, NGO evidence and um, uh, third party evidence, uh, how uncontroversial that uh, proposition is in the international criminal court uh, world, where cases are built from uh, both um, NGO evidence um, which often goes to establish uh, the widespread or the systematic nature of the violations or, or the nature of the conflict and so on. And um, you know, cases are built routinely on a mixture of uh, that type of evidence mixed with um, uh, documentary evidence, um, witness evidence and so on. It's, um, it's a tapestry. Uh, and that's uh, the least controversial um, uh, aspect of international criminal law tribunals. So it's very interesting to hear you talk about that uh, in the UK context. So th that's uh, our panel. Um, Let's uh, uh, now to um, the questions which we've received. I can see we've uh, received uh, six and I'll ask if I may for Rehab to assist uh, with uh, some of these. I think we've got quite a series of questions. Um, Rehab, do you want to go first and pick uh, one of the questions? Sure, thank you all. I can see our top question is from Daniel Gruters. It's for Molly. He asks, is the real problem with the determining breaches of the international human humanitarian law principle of proportionality, not that third parties cannot properly know the concrete and direct military advantage anticipated in any given attack, at least without disclosure by the attacker. He also thanks you for your principled resignation. Oh, thank you. Um, 
Okay, so in general, yes, of course, it's difficult to do a proportionality assessment if you don't know the anticipated military advantage and you only know the civilian harm, you've only got one side of the story. Um, unless, of course, as you rightly say, the um, military force carrying out the attack tells you what their anticipated military advantage is, and then you can do the proportionality assessment. But if we presume that, that you're having to do the proportionality assessment blind for the purposes of an arms exports license decision, I would argue that if you are having to do that repeatedly, if you are repeatedly looking at situations where you've got civilian injuries, civilian deaths, and you don't know enough about the anticipated military advantage to be able to do that proportionality assessment, you should be erring on the side of caution. If it happens enough times, if it happens again and again and again, you should not be saying every single time, I don't have enough information to say it is a violation, so I'm just going to not worry about it. I'm not going to I'm not going to say it's not a violation or it is a violation, but I'm certainly not going to treat it as a violation for the purposes of this arms exports risk assessment. I don't think that that's the right thing to do. I think if you don't have enough information, I think you should err on the side of caution, particularly when not erring on the side of caution means selling bombs and aeroplanes to Saudi Arabia for use in Yemen when we've got 20,000 dead civilians and I think 10 million people facing famine. So I totally agree with the premise of the question that yes, it's, it's difficult to know for sure when you're doing it blind, but I think there is an ethically right thing to do that's very clear and that's what I think the UK government should be doing when it's assessing this situation. Thank you. Um, should I ask the next one? This is a question from Christopher Hoff, uh, which is a question for all panelists. Is there any basis for bringing civil proceedings against the arms companies for supplying arms to the regimes? For example, could Yemeni citizens bring action against BAE for supplying the bombs that rain down on them? Particularly if there's evidence that the BAE employees are in Saudi loading the bombs. Could such an action be brought in the UK? Technical question, but um, I'd rather you guys answered it than me. I might have a stab at it. Um, in principle, the answer is yes, these sort of cases can potentially be brought subject to the evidence. Um, it is, however, practically very difficult. And there's a number of reasons for that. First and foremost, the costs risk that individual claimants would run. In the context of judicial review proceedings, you have the benefit that you potentially can rely on cost capping orders, which limit your risk to having to pay the other side's costs if you lose. In the context of private law proceedings, especially ones such as these, where there would be huge amounts of legal issues about things uh, ranging from jurisdiction to secrecy to evidential issues, you can imagine there's a whole host of satellite issues. Uh, you're looking at extremely well-resourced companies who would fight this tooth for nail, and they would run up vast legal bills. If you don't have specific cost protection as a claimant in those kind of proceedings, you risk ruin, financial ruin, quite frankly, and huge bills against you. So that in and of itself is a very big dissuading force. Um, there's also sort of, and I won't go into the detail, there's difficulties in terms of evidential standards and how to approach that. But I think one of the biggest problems is costs. So that is likely to dissuade people from trying. Anybody else want to weigh in or should we move to the next question? Yes, very briefly, I'd like to mention that there is a separate case which CAT is involved in, and so are Muatna and Amnesty, which is a case which has been filed with the International Criminal Court, which uh, relates to the role of European uh, companies in aiding and abetting war crimes in Yemen. That's something which was submitted last December, but we haven't, the, but we haven't had an update on that. Subsequently, I can insert a link so uh, into the chat so that all um, everybody who's 
partaking in this event is able to access it to find out details about it. But that's something which we're hoping to have an update on at some point uh, soon. Um, Bonyan, I don't know if you want to say anything about that claim or has, um, uh, has that been covered by Andrew? Um, I think he was talking about the ICC communication. Mm -hmm. um, it is, um, as its name, it's a communication with the ICC on several uh, um, uh, cases, several cases that were documented by Muatana. And it was um, about the the arms trade, and unfortunately, um, all the legal actions that we are able to do now is is concentrated on the arms trade, because we do not have a lot of space in the international humanitarian law or the uh, international criminal law to to uh, um, explore further um, aspects. Thank you, and of course, um, with the, the the cost of civil claims is perhaps uh, matched by the slowness of international claims. Uh, the ICC is uh, notorious for taking years to come to decisions about um, whether to pursue even a full investigation. So, communications uh, filed today are likely not to be decided upon uh, for several years, and even then. The procedure is such that a full investigation, if 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 uh, sanctioned by the pretrial chamber, then takes place. So you're talking about four, five, six, seven, even longer years before you even get to the point of um, identifying who might be in the um, in, in in who might be a suspect. So um, it's 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 um, it's a big stick, but a very slow one. Should we move to the next question? Um, Rehab, do you want to choose one? Sure. I see the next question is a question for Anna. It's a question from Samantha Orenstein. Besides from the monetary advantage, why is Saudi Arabia politically so important to the UK? Thank you so much for the question. I think it's um, one of the most important things that we need to, to think about. Um, and I think I'd start by saying that the monetary advantage uh, of uh, UK arms sales to Saudi Arabia uh, actually goes to BAE Systems and the associated companies, right, which are private companies. It doesn't come directly to the government. The government makes a series of associated claims about the economic advantages to the national economy of arms exports, but it, it, it's one of the, that is one of the enduring myths that sustains the arms trade, the myth that it is good for the national economy. Uh, and Campaign Against Arms Trade and CIPRI, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, uh, have a report out, I think it's called Special Treatment, um, that demolishes the different elements of those arguments about the, 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 the economic importance of arms exports kind of one by one. But if we're thinking more broadly about kind of the economic relationship um, between the UK and Saudi Arabia, um, people often think that it, well, it's oil. The answer is oil. But actually, it's not really just the direct supply of oil or, or even of gas. Uh, there's a broader centrality of both petrodollars and Gulf capital to the operation of British capitalism. Uh, David Wearing has written a book called Anglo Arabia that, that sets this out in, in really brilliant detail. Um, but I think I'd add, add on a couple of things to that. One is kind of about um, money or political economy and the other isn't. I think one of the things that I think is really striking and we haven't really um, had a chance to mention tonight and often doesn't get mentioned because of the horror of the devastation of the war is that actually Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates are not only destroying Yemen, they are also investing in it and providing aid. They are the biggest aid providers to Yemen. So there is this kind of double-edged sword of destruction and reconstruction. So there is a transformation of Gulf capitalism happening into which Yemen is being kind of forcibly incorporated. And the UK wants to, to remain part of that. It wants to have a hand in those developments. And then more generally, kind of other, other, um, other sorts of reasons, I think are really bound up uh, with, with British self-identity 
as an ostensibly major power in the aftermath of empire, right? This phrase punching above our weight, there is this kind of punching above our weight syndrome of a primarily white male, upper class, moneyed political class that really genuinely does believe that we have to support the Saudis against the Iranian backed Houthis, which is like this shorthand for the enormous complexity of the awfulness of the war, the long running character of the war in Yemen. So I think these, it, I think it is primarily about kind of a political economy, but it is also bound up with British perceptions of what sort of country we are. And I think that's also one of the ways in which ordinary people might be able to get more interested in this. It's actually, that, that's not the country we want to be. Thank you, Anna. Um, we have a few more questions. Um, uh, a question from Michael Owen. Thank you to the whole panel for what has been said so far. I have three questions. I hope that's okay. One, what is the role of the Joint Incidents Assessment Team in Yemen? Does it provide much accountability? Two, what is the best thing that ordinary citizens in the UK can do to try to bring about a change in government policy? Three, what is the problem with the government's new, new arms exports licensing process? Who wants to go first with that? I can go for the first part of, um, of this question on the, on the GIAT or Joint Assessment Team. Um, the, the GIAT has problems um, or issues from so many different levels. The general idea of GIAT that uh, these countries that are committing these patterns of violations themselves um, decided that they will um, 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 assign a group of, of people that they think are okay to assess the, the strikes that this very similar group of people who assigned them are, are doing so. So generally, the, the general idea of, of the, of the jihad is faulted, it's biased, uh, because it is the same governments that are committing these violations, uh, assigning these people for, uh, for, for this group of uh, doing investigation. And that's the general idea. And then when we go into the details of the of the GIAT, it's that the process itself is not transparent in any way. We do not know how does the GIAT collect its information. We do not know how does the the GIAT um, conduct their uh, interviews if the if they are actually doing interviews with people. Um, where do they get their information from? We do not know, and there is. Uh, nothing on the public domain that we could uh, we were able to to find, and then it's um, the the process and the results are not very comprehensive. They they are working on really tiny amount of the airstrikes that are com committed by the coalition, and um, with these. With the, with the very, very tiny amount of, of these uh, strikes, they still, most of the results that they come out with is very biased. And although it is very clearly shown in the public domain by organizations like Muatana, Human Rights Watch, and a lot of other organizations, that uh, it's, these incidents have been unlawful, you will see that the results of the, of the GIAT is very, very different. And so, um, and the last thing that they do is, is even in the decisions where they think that these incidents are unlawful um, and the people who are harmed deserve um, compensation, for example, we haven't heard of actual accountability or compensation for uh, for these people, for example, there was a strike I think in Hajja, um, where the Jiyat um, put the, their their decision and uh, their opinion as an unlawful. Uh, the people deserve to to have uh, compensations, 
uh, when contacting these people and the people who were affected by this, like they said, they were not contacted by the jihad or anybody else with anything. So even in the very, very little incidents that the jihad uh, uh, thinks that it's unlawful, um, it's not practically um, uh, um, compensating people or th they do not have the authority to, to put people, to have people accountable for them. Thank you, uh, Bonyan. Um, let's, the second question was uh, for anyone who wants to take this. Um, this is a big question. What is the best thing that ordinary citizens in the UK can do to bring about a change in government policy? That's probably uh, several panels uh, material there. Can I come back on this one very briefly? Um, I should first of all say that the answer uh, Bonian just gave about Jaya is a really good comprehensive one um, about the flaws in the system. The only thing I would add is that the Saudi regime has already given a pardon to all uh, RAF personnel, to all Saudi Air Force personnel taking part in the bombardment. So I don't believe that accountability is really key to anything which they are pursuing. And it's a regime which can't be trusted to run free and fair elections, but is somehow trusted to investigate itself for war crimes. But in terms of what we can do about it. I would urge everybody um, who's taking part in this event and everybody who watches this event to get involved in organisations, whether it is Campaign Against Arms Trade, whether it is Amnesty International or the other excellent organisations all across the UK, and to make sure that your MP knows your views, to raise these kind of issues, to share the information which is published about it, and to make sure that this issue stays in the political agenda. Every year we do polling of public opinion in relation to arms exports and it always shows the same thing which is actually on this issue um, the overwhelming majority of the public are firmly opposed to these arms sales but what we need to do is ensure that it stays as a political issue it stays as something which the government is ashamed of it stays as something which people know is happening and is something which especially at a time where we have a very swamped news agenda with uh, covid brexit and everything else which is going on because the atrocities which are being inflicted can only be inflicted because of weapons which are being sold. If UK and US uh, stopped selling the weapons, then the war would, then the bombardment would have to end very quickly. Um, the Saudi regime could not do it alone, and that's why we'd urge everybody to get involved. And whether it is your local campaign against arms trade group, whether it is other groups around the country, but to make sure that you are staying active, that you are staying involved, that you are raising your voice and that you're letting your opinions be known because the people of, the UK, of this country are firmly opposed to these arms sales. We need to mobilise that opposition as much as possible. Thank you. Um, let, let's, uh, I think the third question has probably been answered by the panel. So let me move to um, Joel, who um, asked a question, um, I think one of the first questions um, at um, half past nine, this evening. Um, so um, actually it's my half past nine, your half past eight. Um, so Joel asks, um, perhaps this is a naive question, but I was wondering what type of situation would constitute a clear risk in the eyes of the British government? Uh, any examples, question mark. And then the second question um, is from Joel too. The applicable law on export, li export licenses is fairly clear, the EU common position and the ATT, but there is a lack of accountability re third state such as the UK. What chance would a claimant have in bringing a case before the ECHR? In the Commission's Tuga decision, the um, court rejected this type of complaint, but I'm wondering if the court's jurisprudence will evolve, especially with the MH17 case and Russia's complicity. I was wondering if the panelists could share their thoughts on this. So first question, clear risk. Uh, what, what would constitute a clear risk? Any, any thoughts? Yeah, can I take that one? About what will constitute a clear risk? Um, I'm not gonna answer it. I'm just going to comment that that really is the million dollar question. And as far as I know, and please do correct me if I'm wrong, because I'd love to see this. As far as I know, the UK government has never pinned its colours to the mast and said what would constitute 
what kind of situation would constitute that threshold being met? Um, so that's a great question. That's not a great answer, I accept. May I, may I follow on from that, please? I think what I was going to answer to Molly was I'd say, well, obviously we have the, one of the world's most robust arms export control regimes in the world, right? Which is the absolute standard line that is trotted out. Uh, there's a wonderful Tumblr site, Rigorous Repetition, that shows you just how often this is, this is trotted out. I think the answer, the um, kind of a formal answer to that question is only in situations that are of low economic value or to states that are politically opposed to the UK. And even then there's not very many. But actually, uh, so a good example of that would be, um, this is from sort of a couple of decades ago, was when there was um, kind of these discourses around pariah states and pariah types of weapons. But they were never our friends anyway. So we can make a really big virtue out of, look how, so this is kind of kind of going back to some of the um, foreign policy with an ethical dimension um, type of times. Look how virtuous and benevolent the UK is because it will take action on these particular types of weapons or to these particular types um, of governments, but they are never our friends. If you look to countries like, uh, countries like India, countries like Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states, countries like Israel that are both economically but also politically central to UK foreign relations, um, you, you just won't, you won't see it and you will see it all dressed up in the language um, both of um, kind of a, a rigorous bureaucratic regime and also a benevolent foreign policy. In terms of Dealing with the second part of the question, the ECHR and ECHR jurisdiction, uh, the short answer is probably it'd be very tough to get a case before the ECHR and get the ECHR to claim jurisdiction in this scenario. Um, you've got the test of effective control, which requires a fairly direct link for extraterritorial jurisdiction. So even if you have one of these cases brought by a victim, if you look at the case line Alskani and Jalud and the like, um, there has really been an effort to constrain this to a direct link. And if you're going via the sale of arms, via the provision of intelligence or monetary support or anything of that ilk, um, as things stand, it would be very tough to get the court to find jurisdiction. And I don't necessarily expect that to change imminently because the court has already been subject to huge pressure and criticism over the extent to which our extraterritorial jurisdiction has expanded over past years and there doesn't seem to be the appetite to expand it much beyond that. So for at least the median term, it's likely that domestic public law challenges of the kind brought in these proceedings are a more fruitful avenue for this. Thank you, Nick. Uh, another question, I think this is um, uh, a useful follow on from what Nick just said about um, domestic challenges um, from Peter Langford. In relation to the basis for a legal challenge, although this has not been a subject of litigation, in addition to the foundation breaches of IHL, is there any scope given the use of cluster munitions supplied by UK manufacturers for the applicability of the Cluster Munitions Convention? which in place of international humanitarian law imposes an absolute prohibition on their use. As um, maybe this is a question for um, Andrew, I don't know if your organization considered that um, uh, uh, convention. Um, with that specific con I can't give a legalistic answer, but as I understand it with that specific convention, um, the UK had the cluster bombs that had been sold to Saudi Arabia, according to the UK, had been sold uh, many years ago. I think what that underlines is that the lifespan of a weapon is very much longer than the lifespan of the political situation it's sold into. And that when a weapon has been sold and left these shores, we have no way of knowing how it will be used in the future or who it will be used against. As I understand that Saudi Arabia is not a signatory to that convention. 
and the UK's defence at the time when it was raised in Parliament was very much along the lines of these, these so, were sold years ago. Um, so it somehow was not a uh, reason to stop the arms sales in itself, despite what it told us about the character of the regime. And I think the character of the regime is a very fundamentally important point because it's not just the use of cluster bombs, which has shown its total disregard for human rights, it's not just murder of Jamal Khashoggi, which has shown its total disregard for human rights. It's the authoritarian rule which has presided over Saudi Arabia for decades and the oppression which is being inflicted on people across Saudi Arabia every day. And yet somehow this regime has been entrusted with the means to kill and to carry out a brutal bombardment which has lasted five years. The fact that these cluster bombs show what a total disregard for human rights and human lives has been fueling this terrible war. Thank you, Andrew. We've got uh, four minutes left, so I'm going to ask um, a question for all panellists uh, so that we can leave the audience either deeply depressed or with a little um, optimism for the future. Question from Astrid, uh, Astrid Blomink. Uh, what are your thoughts for the future of arms trading? Are you hopeful about an eventual change in policy? I'll go if in the absence of anyone else. Um, I, I actually am hopeful. Um, Joe Biden's pledge to end US support for the Saudi action in Yemen was still on his website the last time I checked obsessively, I think at the weekend. Um, and I think that that is something to give us hope. Um, if the US stopped uh, providing arms to the Saudis for use in Yemen, and there was a groundswell of opinion in the UK, which just made it non-negotiable for the UK government to accept that this was unlawful. Are the UK going to seriously continue with this in the face of a divergence of policy with the US, which is such a key ally, and opinion here that this is illegal? I, I don't know, but I think that that is something to give us cause for some hope. I can see Anna laughing. I, I almost want to stay, st stop there, but uh, Anna. <laughs> it's, I, I would love to be as optimistic as Molly and maybe given your background, maybe I ought to be, and maybe I ought to listen to you more. I suppose I would, uh, I suppose I would rec uh, uh, resurrect Antonio Gramsci's uh, saying, pessimism of the intellect, but optimism of the will. I think when I think uh, with my academic hat on, uh, about the, the the prospects and the trends, I think with the the advent of Brexit uh, and the central role being kind of advocated for arms exports and resurrecting the British economy somehow, uh, and and in uh, re-establishing some sort of global post-imperial role for Britain, it makes me extremely pessimistic and extremely nervous. Uh, and frankly, I don't think the British government uh, give a damn what the British public thinks about arms exports. We are not its main audience. Uh, however, I think there is, we still have some vestiges of parliamentary democracy in this country, and so I think it's our job to try and make the government care about what people think. And I think there are such a wide range, uh, such a wide range of legal cases, such a wide range of direct action that is happening, uh, such a wide range of, of public concern that I think we have no option but to try and be optimistic about it. Thank you. And uh, could be 30 seconds from Andrew, Nick, and then uh, finally Bonyan on the same question. Yeah, I'm, I think we, we have to be optimistic um, because so many things seem so far away, so impossible until they've been achieved and then they become common sense. And you'll never get anyone who'll admit to, uh, to having supported these things in the first place, despite the fact they keep happening. And I like to think that we, have beaten them in court before, we'll beat them again, but it's about more than cat. It's about the movement overall. It's about the solidarity which we have to stand in with people in Yemen and beyond. And I would hope that there's a time in decade, uh, in the not too distant future where people are saying, I can't believe we ever sold weapons. That's really wrong. And that is what we have to be trying to work towards. And I think events like this are an important part in helping us to set the grounding to try and one day reach that point. Thank you. Nick. It's also a question of how you define the goalposts. You might not succeed in an absolute, can we stop the arms trade or stop the arms trade in relation even to places where they will 
where wetlands sold will go to bad use and will cause very significant harm. But it is also just a question of accountability on trying to ensure that as much as possible, there is a review of where weapons go, of how they are used, of who sells them. And in that context, the kind of advocacy efforts um, and the kind of litigation efforts that have defined this case will continue to be extremely useful. And I think that has to be seen as an incremental process and a process that all of us remain involved in. And if one looks at it that way, it's definitely something we can all keep chipping away at and hopefully have a positive impact in that context. Thank you. Bonyan, it seems fitting to end with uh, you. Um, well, thank you for that question. And yeah, of course, we are hopeful for not, I mean, with the presence of people like you and activists um, and lawyers who are taking this very seriously, we are, I think that, um, yes, it will stop and people will be held accountable. And that will be a very important first step for ending the entire war, honestly. Thank you very much. Um... Well, I, I think we can all agree this has been a uh, fabulous um, panel and with, with great insights and great commitment and great passion for the, for the subject. I'm sure that, that uh, they've given us a lot to think about. Um, unfortunately, not much of it very pleasant, but uh, nonetheless, it's been a, a fascinating panel. Thank you to the panelists, um, Bonyan, Andrew, Molly, Nick, Anna, and of course to Rehab who uh, brought together these fantastic panelists uh, for this discussion. Um, really a, a brilliant panel. Uh, so thank you very much for attending and um, well, we look forward to future events. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne, as well for chairing. Um, this has been an incredibly informative event. I know for me personally as well. Um, I can only echo Wayne's thank yous to all of the panelists and to just end basically on a note of where is where there is a will there is a way uh, there is a team in every area doing work for to improve the lives of civilians in Yemen and across the world when it comes to transferring arms to states who are committing violations of international humanitarian law and I know there were questions, there were a lot more questions that people were interested to know the answers to. And all I can do is say the knowledge is out there somewhere. And if we all look for it, we will be sure to find it. And I hope this has been as informative to all of the attendees. Thank you all for signing up. If you would be interested, and if you're not already, please do sign up to become a member of the Human Rights Lawyers Association. And I hope you all have an amazing evening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Rehab and Green. Goodbye. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone.